Hello and welcome to the Sound on Sound recording and mixing podcast. I'm Paul White and this time around I'll be looking at how connecting effects in a different order can produce very different results. The same considerations apply to both plugins and hardware including effects pedals. The traditional effects chain has some parallels with an analog synth signal path, starting with a distortion to add harmonics, filters to shape the sound, modulation effects to add movement, and finally reverb or delay to add space. However, there are lots of reasons to break or bend many of the rules, but there's one that you should stick to, and that is to place any pitch correction, pitch tracking, or formant shifting plugins at or near the start of the chain where the signal is cleanest. They can go after EQ or compression, but placing them after modulation, reverb or delay will compromise their ability to track the pitch of the incoming audio, resulting in audible glitching. Of course, if you want to create audible glitching as an effect, then try putting effects such as reverb, delay, modulation or distortion before your pitch device. You never know what'll happen. For guitar players, the first rule to get broken dates back to when the amplifier itself added most or all of the necessary distortion and, as amps with effects loops were not around at the time, any effects went before the amplifier. In practice, this meant that distortion ended up being the last thing in the chain. So many classic guitar sounds were created this way, that in order to emulate them, we also have to move our distortion plugins to a later position in the chain. The classic example is the wah-wah pedal, which, being a filter, you would think would go after distortion or fuzz if you approach things from a synth programmer's perspective. However, to get the sound we're more familiar with, the wah-wah has to come before the distortion or your amp modelling plug-in. The outcome being that the frequency peak boosted by the wah-wah pedal gets treated to the heaviest distortion. Not only does this deliver the classic rock sound, but it also helps keep levels under control. Those high resonant peaks are tamed by the clipping effect of the distortion stage, which behaves somewhat like a limiter in that respect. Here's an example of wah-wah before distortion. And now here's an example of Wawa coming after distortion. You can also apply the rules of the previous scenario to the combination of EQ and distortion. If the EQ goes before distortion, then any frequencies boosted by the EQ are going to be the most distorted. If you put the EQ after distortion, then the EQ will act conventionally, cutting or boosting frequencies present in the output of the distortion plugin. Another example of the sound we accept because that's the way it was done back in the day is a phaser fed into a moderately distorted amplifier. Jimi Hendrix was a high profile user of this combination. He used a univibe pedal feeding his distorted amplifier. By placing the modulation before the distortion, the churning effect of the modulation is softened, whereas placing it afterwards makes the modulation much more obvious. In creative circles, there's room for both options once you know that there will be a difference. Here's the sound of a phaser before distortion. And now here's the same phaser after distortion. The stronger the modulation effect, the more obvious the difference when changing the connection order. For example, here's a flanger fed into a fuzz. And now again with the fuzz before the flanger. It's less obvious where to put a compressor in a signal chain, and in reality it can go in many positions, depending on the effect that you're after. For example, what happens when you place a compressor before an EQ? Well, if you put the compressor first, the EQ will work conventionally on the compressor's output. If you put the EQ before the compressor, then the compressor will respond most strongly when it hears the boosted frequencies. For example, here's a fairly aggressive EQ boost applied before compression. <laughs> 
now the same EQ boost after compression. The difference can be quite subtle, but having the compressor following the EQ usually gives the smoother sound. There are also choices to be made when compression and overdrive are used in combination. A typical overdrive pedal applies more distortion to the early part of a transient sound, such as a guitar or a piano, with the amount of distortion reducing as the sound dies away. If you put a compressor before the distortion, the sound will sustain for longer and therefore be more heavily distorted for longer. This is the effect of compression placed before an overdrive. If you put the compressor after the overdrive, you'll still get more sustain, but the relationship between the amount of distortion and the input signal level will be dictated entirely by the distortion stage. Either combination can be used to enhance the sustain of a sound and may allow you to work with a lower level of distortion to obtain a clearer sound. Here's overdrive before the compression. Now sometimes the difference between the two arrangements can be quite subtle, especially if the amount of overdrive is low, but you'll still usually prefer one to the other. One point to note, however, is that compressors bring up any noise present in the input signal, so having them close to the start of the signal chain produces the quietest results. Reverbs and delays tend to sound most natural if placed at the end of the signal chain or in the effects loop of an amplifier. Feeding either of these effects into anything other than mild distortion can end up sounding quite dense and messy. You have more flexibility when combining delay and modulation effects as either order can yield good results. If the modulation comes first, then the delay or the reverb will soften the modulation sound and add some textural complexity. Putting the modulation after reverb or delay sounds much more obvious. For example, here's a rotary speaker placed before a long reverb. And now the rotary speaker placed after a long reverb. If you use both delay and reverb together, what's the best order in which to connect them? Well, if both produce very clean results, then you shouldn't hear much of a difference, but if the delay adds a little bit of analogue dirt, then it might be best to put that before the reverb. This isn't a hard and fast rule, so try both options and see if you can hear a difference. Having established the delay and reverb after distortion rule, it's the one that is sometimes broken to create a deliberately washy sound, now I have to say that this isn't something I find particularly useful in my own productions, but give it a try by feeding a long, very wet reverb into distortion or fuzz. This produces a very dense wall of sound that can be further shaped using filters, modulation, EQ or even reverb. Here's a sound example which is a long reverb fed into fuzz. With typical guitar pedals, most users tend to connect them in a series chain, but in a door environment you could feed two entirely different effects chains from two aux sends rather than having a single chain set up via channel inserts. This is what we call a parallel configuration. The main difference here is that effects in one chain won't have any effect on what's happening in the other chain, so you could, for example, have heavily flanged fuzz on one send and perhaps delay and a rotary speaker on the other, 
You can also pan the two chains left and right to create a wide stereo spread, as in the following example. One way to control vocal levels in a door is to use compression in combination with level automation. However, if you simply put the compressor in the channel insert point, it will come before the channel level fader that you're automating. That means the compressor will be working quite hard on the louder sounds and not so much on the quieter ones, which can lead to a tonal inconsistency. This becomes more obvious the greater the level fluctuations in the original vocal performance, so the option that I favour is to route the channel via a bus and put the compressor in the bus insert point. That way the compressor comes after the fader automation. Set up in that way, the compressor is dealing with a more consistent input level, so it doesn't have to work so hard. What comes out of all this is that most of the so-called rules aren't really rules at all, but merely guidelines. Follow them if you want predictable results, but try other possibilities just to see what happens. You won't break anything by breaking the rules and you might come up with some really interesting sounds. Well, that's it for this time and thanks for listening. You can find other Sound on Sound podcasts on soundonsound.com forward slash sos podcasts.